Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all. As we practiced some mantra this afternoon, let us repeat one of them. It's the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam. Seven times, please. Om Nam Om Nam Om Nam This afternoon we had some meditation, the three major kinds of practice that we do, they were all explained and you've got some initial experience. In fact, we were working with the notion of self, but we didn't start with the notion because that's a product. The way you feel, the way you look at yourself, the way you see yourself is a product of a process. All your past karma results in this moment. Everything you do at this moment will give you future results. It is remarkable how little we know about ourselves as a species and also as an individual. We have many users manual to something that we really don't understand at first. And that is the self, what we call I, the human being itself. There are many religions who tell you who you are. There are many ways to understand yourself. But there are very few paths to directly experience who you truly are instead of believing your ideas about who you should be or should not be. And Zen is one of those paths to offer direct insight into who you are or where you came from and where you're going. The Buddha himself taught that the self originally does not exist. And many of us in the West find this uncomfortable at first. What does that really mean? I don't really exist? I'm here. I have a body. I have a soul. I have thinking. I have feelings. What does this really mean? Well, it means that originally the notion of self does not exist. We make it. As you build up habits, you become someone. As you remove habits, you stop being the person that you had known before. It's like a campfire. Imagine many pieces of wood and then the spark. If you push the wood close together, then the fire burns very high. If you pull the wood apart, the fire burns low and sometimes it can go out. Look at the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra says that we are actually made of five major components. Form, that's the body. Feelings slash sensations. The perceptions of these feelings. And then we have responses, impulses. And we have what we call consciousness. These are the five major pieces of wood. If we put them together, then your soul has a body, a vehicle to use. And we have a consciousness that looks at this and manages all this. The body is the hardware, the soul is the software, and your consciousness is the operator. In Zen, we do not try to fix the hardware so much, so this isn't a healing course. We are not trying to fix the software with another software, so this is not a self-development course. But we are looking for the operator. Because if we clarify the operator, we can make meaningful and correct changes to our hardware and software, especially the software, especially the content of our self, our soul. What the Buddha discovered is something very interesting. 
that there is no fixed or permanent part of your soul. There is no thinking that would be permanent. There is no feeling that would be permanent. Anything you look at inside as your dualistic ideas and opinions, they are not permanent. They were not there before, and after a while they will not be there again. So something changes. What is it that sees that change? And that's what we are interested in. So we have something inside we call our true nature that sees the change in ourselves. Every cell in the body changes every seven years. So if you look at it gradually, the body remains the same. It's impossible that one day you wake up and you are alive without a body. But if you go back seven years, none of these cells were the same, so they kept changing. Now if you look at the ingredients of your own soul, all those thoughts, all those feelings, all those notions of good and bad, past, present and future, they all change. But there's something inside that perceives all this that doesn't come and doesn't go. Doesn't change, is not dualistic, it's not something qualitative or quantitative. You can't grab it, you can't put it into a form, yet this is what sees and perceives everything. We can call this like non-self, but originally it has no name and no form. Impossible to define, but we use it all the time. Because in fact, that listening to me right now, in each and every one of you, using your ears, your hearing consciousness, your mind, your intellect, your feelings, all these channels, but the final screen, the final surface of perception is this that has no name, no form, no life, no death. Now we give many names to it and many forms to it, but these are relevant in a certain cultural context, within a certain religion, creed, or other forms of knowing and believing. If we take all this away, what is it that remains? Attain this moment. Then you see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, think, and feel clearly. This hit killed all the Buddhas, all the gods, all the Bodhisattvas, every human idea about right and wrong, heaven and hell, samsara and nirvana. If you listen carefully, you return before dualities, before birth and death, coming and going. Then your mind is 100% clear, 100% present, completely perceptive, Compassionate, because you feel what others feel. Wise, because you can perceive others thinking. How we think, how we approach life. On this path, we can only lose our own illusions. What we need, we already have. There's nothing to get, except we just have to lose our own karmic attachments our own habits that are like sabotaging our own path. And in this room, everybody knows what it means to follow habits to the wrong direction. We all have that. Everyone in society has these tendencies. But when they become condensed, when they become really focused, when you see how the mind creates its own reality, and if it doesn't correspond with a greater reality around us, then soon, we are in ignorance, we are in greed, we have anger, and these are the karmas that we manufacture for ourselves and others. If we take away all these illusions, we return to this clarity, then we have a choice. Without that, we are tied and bound just to our previous karma. And if we have a choice, what kind of life would you want to live? What kind of qualities would you like to impart to the world to those people around you? What kind of relationships would you want? And many times we feel we have no choice. In fact, it is only our own limitations in the mind that deprive us from having a clear choice. So when we meditate, we open the mind up 360 degrees completely, becoming present 
right at this moment, 100%. And when we attain our true nature, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, then we have complete choice. There are many ways to be reborn onto this earth. Most of us bring our homework with us. And this homework is sometimes like a heavy backpack, which you don't see, but it really presses you. It's the burden you don't think about, but you just feel that it's there. And during meditation, you can actually put down the backpack, and it's right in front of you. You can see what kind of karma you carry in your heart, and you have a choice. Take some out and put something else in. And that's how we change. That's how we change our character. That's how we change our life. One of you asked me in the break, ego and karma, are they the same or different? And that's a wonderful question. If you make ego out of your karma, immediately you see hindrances. Karma is your raw material. It's just your habits. If you use your habits correctly, you can progress on the path. It's like putting fuel into your engine. But if you become selfish, if you believe the world revolves around you, and you use your karma in the wrong way, you explode the same fuel in the middle of your own apartment. Then there's tragedy. There's burnout. Because you didn't put the same fuel into your car. You just exploded that in the middle of your own living room. Same karma, different usage. And that's why we have to recognize what is our true situation, where we are, and then realize our relationship, with whom are we together, and then have some correct function, correct action, correct speech. Ego is not an entity, it's an attitude. You can use your karma selflessly, or you can use your karma selfishly. It's your choice. The results are apparent. Egotistical views result in egotistical speech and action. And ultimately, it results in isolation. You stop caring about another person. You stop caring about your group, your people, your environment. Because only you matter. And the natural response from the environment is that you're left alone. You are left in isolation. So that your own suffering would open you up. And we are lucky if that happens before we die. If our ego was an entity, it would be very easy to get rid of it. We would just have to go to surgery. And this entity would be removed either from the body or the mind, and we would be free. But fortunately, this is not the case. If you make your ego, you have it. If you don't make your ego, you don't have it. Remember that when you have a rough time. And the way to get out of this burden, the way to get out of this prison, is just one question. How may I help you? The moment somebody else becomes more important than you, you can help that person. And this helpful action actually is the way out of your own prison. But for that, you have to believe that this is a better way than focusing just on yourself. No one can give you that faith. Only your own experience. And it starts with the original non-existence of your karma. The original non-existence of your ego. The original non-existence of your own notion of self. And that's why we go to such great length to teach you how to meditate, to see the relativity of your own existence. That it does depend on causes and conditions. It does depend on your own actions and speech and feelings and thoughts. In fact, that's all that it depends on. It doesn't depend on higher being or beings. It doesn't depend on the past. It doesn't depend on anybody else. Only you. Only us. We are the masters of our own fate. We are the captains of our own soul. Marlowe, Tamerlane, remember that. So meditation teaches you how to be spiritually adult. Our bodies grow. We become physically adults within a foreseeable time after we're born. Is our mind adult? Or we are still having some childish dreams about ourselves and the world? To give you the autonomy that you already have is any correct spiritual teacher's job. 
we are not selling water by the river. We just remind you that you have the potential to wake up. In Zen, we call that Buddha nature, the potential to become enlightened. No one can give you that. No one can take this away from you, but you can cover it with your own karma, with your own identification, with your own delusions, layer by layer, moment to moment, you can lose focus, you can divert, you can follow your habits, okay? It's possible. Even the best mirror can be covered up, distorted, even broken. When we meditate, we activate the self-cleansing capability of the mind. The self-cleansing capability is our potential for awakening. In fact, this is our greatest human obligation, but since it has to come out of your own free decision, no one can force you to do this. No one should force you to do this. The only real force is your own suffering. Maybe other people's suffering, if you are compassionate enough. So then you do the job. You really get down to business and do, do some real house cleaning inside. And that's what helps you. And that's what helps other beings at the same time around you. The wisdom of cause and effect is frightfully clear. It's unmitigable and unalterable, no matter what kind of opinion we have. You can have a good opinion of yourself, a bad opinion of yourself, or the world. It doesn't change the way we operate. It just makes your connection, your relationship, more or less easy. It depends on us. If you find it hard to get through to another person, then ask yourself, what kind of hindrance do we have between us? Why can't I be direct? Why can't I be just compassionate? Why can't I have a simple, wise, clear mind? What's the hindrance? What am I holding? What am I attached to? And this has to go without a sense of guilt. In fact, this deep sense of I am guilty prevents you from correcting your mistake. Don't identify with your mistake. See your mistake. It's different. If you see your mistake, you can correct it. If you identify with it, never. There's only the cycles of relieving yourself from pain and then getting back there again. Relieving yourself again from the sense of guilt and falling again. Don't play with your identity. Correct your mistake. That's all. And then your identity becomes clear. Don't make anything. Don't hold anything. Don't want anything special. Don't check your mind and don't worry. Then you don't identify with the wrong things. You don't identify with anything dualistic in the mind. And you can stay clear, you can stay present, you can function as a true human being. So who has any questions? My question is, based on what you said, do you think we're obliged to be in the pursuit of that non-self? We are not obliged, but we have an option to do so. If your curiosity doesn't teach you, then your limitations will. And this is a general subject, not directed to you personally. No, no, no. I understand. It was a general question. I think we have several pressure factors in this life. The biggest is that we will die. And why are we born? Why are we alive? And when we die, where do we go? This is very natural to ask. Where do we find the answers? So if we look around within the known personality of ourselves, we don't find satisfactory answers. We have to leave our comfort zone. And then we get some answers beyond that. So it's not an obligation, it's an option. But if we ask the right question and we pursue it, we naturally go beyond the boundaries of the known self. And then we get somewhere. Okay, so otherwise we just dwell and be ignorant, going around in circles, that's what you're saying. Well, that's an option to do so. Yeah, that's an option too, not a very pleasant one. Well, in fact, it's pleasant for a very long time. If you build up the right habits, then it's a very pleasant repetition. If you have a good life and a good karma, you can repeat that for a very, very long time. But once you see that you're not getting anywhere, then this creepy feeling comes, oh my God, I'm walking in circles. I'm actually not getting anywhere. And that's when your path really begins. Tsung Chan Sui said, only go straight, don't know. 
And I wondered for many years, come on, why only go straight means don't know? Or why are these mm -hmm. two phrases together in the same sentence? It turns out that if you perpetuate your own thinking habits, you're only going in circles. And once you stop thinking, you actually progress. You don't seem to get anywhere. But I give you a metaphor. Quite a few years ago, an astronomer had a very strange idea. And they turned the Hubble telescope to a completely dark spot in the sky near the constellation of Lyra. And they found something totally mind-boggling. What seemed to be just a dark spot in the sky contains hundreds of millions of galaxies. They just haven't seen through that spot earlier. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see that, then find this Hubble ultra deep field. Use this search phrase. And this was so fascinating that they repeated it a few years later with better optics and better processing. And what came out of that is the Hubble ultra deep field 3D. And that's an amazing metaphor how this seemingly nothing or not knowing or seemingly just a dark spot in the sky contains a totally different worldview, something out there that defines us and we haven't seen it so far. Now we can see it because we could leave the Milky Way. So it's the same thing with ourselves. We keep this don't know mind and in this mirror of not knowing, all our karma begins to appear, even as distant as those stars and galaxies out there. Then we can really go straight and not just go around, around our own black hole. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You were talking about uh, correcting your mistakes. If you see one, correct it. If you don't, you will keep repeating it, if yep. I understood you. So if you want to correct your mistake, but there is something holding you back, like pain inflicted by the other, how do you deal with that? First, you have to see what kind of part you play in it. It's not obvious that someone can inflict pain on you. You have to be there for that. And once you stop being there for that, then the pain is not inflicted anymore. You really need to find a path which is not about you. And that's a contradiction, I know, it's a paradox. But like I said in the introductory, if you ask, how may I help you, not from the person who inflicted pain from you, but somebody who is ready to receive your help, then immediately your focus shifts. And you can go beyond that hindrance. If you're holding your pain, that pain will hinder you. If you learn from your pain, your pain will help you. Whatever mistake you made on your part that that pain came about, attain that mistake, learn that mistake, and don't hold your head under the stick anymore. It's not your job to be somebody's punch bag. You don't have to be somebody's surface to inflict pain upon. It's not your obligation. You don't have that destiny. So stop being that, and then you can get out of that situation. You can get out of that relationship. Originally, you have no such obligation to just feel pain from someone. You have to make a decision. Enough. I don't continue like this. I'm going to live a different life. I cut the cord. Goodbye. It's possible to do that. Just believe in yourself more, and you can perform all this. What I think is very hard to, to say goodbye to, or it's just some process, is the relationship with God, like the God that I thought I had, uh, or knew, or I don't know, worship maybe. But there's not really coming something into place, like it was some, um, you know, I had some connection with it, maybe to uh, say a prayer, hope, or... Um, say goodbye to worship, then God will say hello to you. The worship is keeping the distance. Hmm. Don't worship. Become one with God. As long as you worship, you and God will be separate. The moment you cut off thinking, your substance, God's substance, whole world substance, become one. In mystical Christianity, 
they term it as being in God's presence. But actually, there's no one there. You just stop worshipping, stop making distance between you and God. And then something happens, we call the experience of oneness. And you and God disappear. And then you're complete. Because the distance between you and God also disappeared. And out of that experience comes something that I cannot explain and no one can explain. It's the same thing when you sit and your notion of self disappears. At that time there's no enlightenment, no suffering, no Buddha, no sentient being. We are shooting for that oneness. And that's why in Zen we say, if you meet Buddha, kill Buddha. It's for the same reason. If you have God, don't worship God. Become one with God. And then all these ideas that are man-made, that has nothing to do with our substance, with our true nature, with the world as it is, all these ideas will go away. The intellect will stop buzzing all these things that we believe. And then peace, happiness, compassion, wisdom, togetherness, it's all resulting out of this oneness experience. But for that, we have to sacrifice our own delusions, our own habits, our own ignorance. And look at the way humanity has been arguing about the notion of God for thousands of years. This argument has nothing to do with God itself. So that's why there is this saying, be still and know that your true nature is God. And once you get there, then worship disappears. Also, arrogance and ignorance also disappear. And meditation can help you do that. You don't lose God. You just lose the distance and you lose ignorance. That's all. More questions? I'm a student of the Course of Miracles and there is a, it's a big book and I read every day and I read only one thing, forgive forgiveness and I noticed by myself that it's for me sometimes difficult to forgive some people that hurt me yes because there's still right and wrong in your heart it's wrong to be hurt I try but it's and very course, difficult if you're attached to the past the past controls you all these events happened in the past and please understand that forgiving these people doesn't mean that it's right what they have done to you. Forgiving these people means that you forget them and you're not attached to what they have done and you get out of the karmic cycle of injury and reparation, crime and punishment, offensive and forgiving. Get out of this cycle. So in this sense, the key to freedom is forgiveness. It doesn't make it right what they've done, but you are finished with them. You don't exact revenge. You don't want to be right or wrong about that. You simply put that to the past. We're done. I forgive you. We're not meeting anymore. If I don't forgive you, we meet again. Your choice. Thank you. You're welcome. I've been through uh, quite some changes the last couple of four years. Uh, my life four years ago is nothing compared to what it is right now. I'm, I'm, for instance, I'm helping my parents. They're very old. They're, they're not going to live any. Yeah, they're 92 and 93. Wow. And I'm, I'm trying to be there as often as I can, doing simple things. But I noticed that by doing that, I, I still think I'm going to get rewarded someday. Is it, is it really possible to do something for somebody else without that notion in the back of your head? Like, oh, now I'm saving up for later or something? Actually, if you focus the reward to the present moment, then this desire for future reward is extinguished. Because when you're with your parents, they appreciate your company, they love you back, they appreciate that you're there for them. That's reward enough. And it happens right here, right now. My mom is 85 this year. And I'm trying to be there with her and for her as much as I can. 
And I see it in her eyes that she's not concerned about the remaining years of her life. When we are conversing, when we are solving everyday matters together, the reward is right there in her eyes, in her heart, in her whole being. So don't concern yourself about the future. Just help them as much as possible now. That's it. Nothing more. Thank you, very helpful. I was talking to some people and my experience is when you get like a bit more wisdom, or it always comes from pain or suffering. Not necessarily. But I'm very interested, how do you become the person you are today? What was your decision? Me too. I'm very interested in that. <laughs> but I stopped checking because it reduces my efficiency. So I accept myself as I am, as a person, but I don't accept my mistakes for too long. I correct it. We have to see the unwritten law in the universe that really links us together. If you stop checking your own karma, then you are on the best path to wake up and help other people. First, you really have to accept the loss of illusions, the loss of your self-image, and this kind of cessation of being inherently narcissistic. Because we all have that. We really want to be better than others. We want to put ourselves above the law many times. And everybody suffers, but we suffer less or not so much. It's a general survival sense. And I think it's everybody's past karma that starts to haunt you very early. Mine started in my 20s. Lots of unanswered questions. Lots of critical situations. And they didn't cause physical pain. Yeah, I broke a few limbs when I was a kid. But that's nothing compared to the mind's pain or the soul's unresolved issues. And perhaps the best decision was not to escape. Sometimes we have this escape mechanism that we want to escape from our problems and not know about it or answer our questions with unsatisfactory answers. And I chose not to. I was 24. And that sequence of facing the problems, facing suffering, cause of suffering, end of suffering, and the way to end suffering, the Four Noble Truths, I think that's what got me here. Because I refuse to fight the problem, because it's much bigger than me. I refuse to fly or flee from the problems, because I can't go anywhere. My karma follows me like a shadow. Where can I go? I can't go anywhere without actually dragging my karma with me. So there's nowhere to go except inside. A great yogi said, the only way out is in. I agree. And the decision is not to fight and not to flee and not to freeze. That leaves you with not much else than being aware being insightful, being present, and perceiving cause and effect truly as it is. Not what you think, not what you wish, not what you're afraid of, but as it is. And if you're sincere enough and you go deep enough, anyone can get enlightened. Anyone can be a bodhisattva. It's the Buddhas and the patriarchs teaching, okay? And I'm just happy and I feel privileged that I met Zen Master Sung San and I can follow the path, that's all. So what is your path for everyone? What is your purpose? How do you implement that? What is the meaning of life for you? Don't be afraid of asking these questions because you can find the answer. Not necessarily within your own galaxy, but maybe in a place that you don't know yet. Many times people ask me, why is Zen so theoretical? Zen is not theoretical, but it's going deeper than average. It's not like pedagogy or applied psychology or something scientific or religious. It's very direct and goes to the very root of our own existence. Imagine you go to your favorite market in Amsterdam or in Rotterdam or in The Hague or in Brussels and you want your best fruit, your favorite peaches or grapes or whatever you prefer, apples. And the vendor says, I can give you these apples, no problem. 
But if you want real apples, please get a garden, dig a hole, and put the sapling of an apple tree into it and let that tree grow. And after three to five years, there's a good chance that it will bring apples. That's your apples, because you grew it. So for your own insight, you don't have to suffer, but you have to make effort. Sometimes that effort includes suffering. We can't avoid that, but our insight is not limited to that. Otherwise, the masochists will be Buddhas right away. You inflict a little suffering onto yourself, and that's it? No, it's not that simple. So we get to the root of the matter, because we see this world throughout our notion of self, our own filters, our own boundaries, our own desires and fears. And once we stop doing that, then we are getting somewhere. And that's why we go to the very bottom of the source, where our notion of self comes from, and how we form our own intellectual and emotional reality, how we let desires appear by stimulus and response, and how we live in this world. Because you've heard it, and deep inside you know it. It all depends on us. It depends on us as individuals, as couples, as families, and as society or societies. We have these four kinds of basic karmic boxes. Individual, couple, family, and group. The differences between them, I think, are pretty straightforward. And if we don't clean these four boxes, we will always give contamination from one to another. In a sick society, Without clear ethics, without clear rules, the families are not healthy. If the families are not healthy, then the children will have warped, uncertain, or distorted behavior. Turn it around. If the children are healthy, then it looks like that family life is also healthy, and society should function more or less in an acceptable way. Another observation is that you cannot clean one karma just within its own box. An individual cannot see himself or herself right away. You need first your significant other. And when you fall in love, everything changes. Because that person, if that love is real, becomes more important than you. The reflection becomes more important than your own opinion of yourself. You're very afraid of hurting someone else's feelings or walking into somebody else's hindrances. So love is the first real energy that melts the crust of your own ego. And it has to be like that. We have to have a means to dissolve this absolute boundary of ourself. And then the next big step, when the dual karma becomes family, that's when children appear. And then you see the offspring of your own karma together with your spouse. And then something really important begins because you see how the imprint of your own habits appear in the child. And if you look at the dual karma and the family karma, I have never seen a single person who would not change based on the feedback. What your spouse tells you and what your child gives you back as a clear feedback of your own education, your own character going over to the next generation. It's pretty easy to see how the group gives you feedback. You go to work, you have you no know, friend circles, groups that are based on mutual commitment and not by blood relationship. That feedback is also inevitable. And the ultimate group feedback is the Sangha. The Sangha where we practice the Dharma, where you have a teacher, a lineage of teachers like here, and that gives you another surface, another set of reflections. What kind of effect you have in the group? So if you play with these four, you see where your homework is, where your potential is, and how you can fix your life, how you can develop as an individual. But in an isolated way, it's impossible. We have seen societies isolating themselves and always ending up in anarchy, disaster, wars, etc. If you go small and you look at the Easter Island story, how they cut down all the trees and caused an ecological disaster for themselves over hundreds of years of not seeing what was going on, just building these you know, statues or carving them, which is okay. Worship your ancestors, no problem. 
but don't do it at the expense of your own habitat. That society was isolated. They couldn't learn from any other society, not for centuries. If families become isolated, they also turn totally berserk. You see, sometimes they are in an isolated place on earth, just one flesh and blood family, and then they kind of turn into behaviors that is pretty hard to explain. Go step by step. See how karma works through these four gateways, the individual, the couple, the family, and the group. You find very interesting results and very new ways, new avenues to develop yourself and help others. More questions? I have a question about this uh, family karma. Will this moment come that you need to deal with this? Or, you know, you're actively... Either you choose to deal with it willfully, because family karma is always there. Mm. But it's your choice how close you want to go to the other family members. Mm. Or you wait until family karma comes to your doorstep and you get a phone call, a postcard, or an email. So it's your choice. Sometimes you can actively pursue the change of this karma or just the cultivation of it. We spend more time together. Or you say, okay, I'm distant. I'm keeping my distance as long as possible because I don't want to be part of this flesh and blood family karma. Yeah, sometimes we have that desire, especially in the West. Asia is still way more group oriented. People take the kind of family norms and the social norms way more valid for themselves than just trying to get out of it and seek their own individual freedoms. And I'm never saying that one is better than the other. I've seen too much of East and West. None is better than the other, but the focus is elsewhere. And we can learn from each other pretty much. So it's your choice. But we have a basic responsibility towards especially our parents, sometimes even our siblings, because they gave life to us, they brought us here, they brought us up, they gave us education, home, shelter, food, love, everything, everything. Even if you felt hurt, even if there were dark spots, still that thing was done. You're a healthy individual right now. So that karma needs to go back to them when they need it. It doesn't mean we follow the willpower of the parents. We cannot fulfill their dreams. We cannot walk their paths. We cannot be the persons they want us to be, that's for sure. We walk our own path. But what they need is not the same as what they want. And they should get what they need. But they can almost never get what they want. And think about that when you cultivate family karma. Fulfill the obligation, but do not try to fulfill anybody's dreams. It's never working. I work for an organization, it's a school, and it seems like they don't really want me there. They have ways of letting you know they'd rather see you go. And I don't think it's something personal. It is something, Business. yes. I'm 64. In my case, that means I have quite a bit of life experience, and it led me to places close to, the result is, basically, I'm getting to that point, the point of being in this world, but not always being off it. That's where I find my oneness. That's where I find that I can deal with all this worldly drama. And it's a good place. But it also means that since I'm working for this organization, there's this little voice that tells me, get out of there. Yeah. That's why they probably want to let you go, because <laughs> you don't want to be there. Really. I don't want to be there anymore. So why are you surprised? The universe is responding to you in whatever irrational or unfair way it may seem. But if you don't find yourself useful there, they will boot you out. Even though you may be the most correct workforce, following all the guidelines and fulfilling the rules, good workforce, but they want you out. They want me out. But here's because the problem. Because you want out. Yes, I do so, want out. Why are you yeah, surprised? You no, know, that's not a problem. The problem is, okay. and I think maybe people will recognize this, is that I should leave. Everything, the, here's the reality of life. You need to pay the bills. Yes, we all do. See? Yeah. And I can take a leap of faith and say, I will be taken care of. Something will happen. 
to make sure that I don't end up, you know, in duck and thuislozen. <laughs> Actually, you can leave it per chance, or you can plan your next step. You can get another organization or go private or enter a business. I don't have to give you existential advice. We are here in Holland. You know, this is a very civilized society with a lot of opportunities. You are among problem solvers. Okay? The Dutch are famous for solving problems. Mm -hmm. Okay? So solve the problem instead of waiting for someone to solve it for you. You don't want to be there. It's not unfair to use your rights, not manipulate, use your existing rights for the next step. Get a nice package, they can let you go, and you are a nice workforce whether in or out. And then inside, ask this question, and here's what I'm coming to the point. Mm -hmm. What is my true job? Mm -hmm. Spend weeks with it. I taught you to work with the great question. The great question is usually subject-oriented. It's directed to our true nature. But we can use it with sufficient clarity, underline sufficient, to solve a problem without the interference of our own intellect. We call that the intuitive problem-solving process. You ask, what is my true job? And you keep that question and let the mind produce its temporary results, coming and going, whizzing in and out of your sphere of consciousness. And then one day, an answer comes which doesn't depart from the question. You don't like it or dislike it. You don't attract it or be repulsive with it. Just by perceiving the question, the answer stays there. Any one of us can do that. And when the answer doesn't depart from the question, and you don't touch it with your thoughts or your feelings, you don't make good and bad about it, and it's still there, that's the answer. Then see how you can do that. Don't wait for the world. The world presents you with many stupid things. And in our desperation, because we have to pay the bills, sometimes we make terrible choices. When you're very hungry, don't go to the market because you buy bad food. Go to the market when you still have something in your stomach that can enable you to make good choices. Go beyond your own needs and find your way before you have to. And then when you step on it, you believe in it, you can avoid many critical moments or bad states of existence. What is my true job? And when you found it, you go from the organization with a capital O, harmoniously to your next step, because you already know what you're doing there is not gonna last, you don't believe in it. That's why the universe is pounding you, do you wanna let me go? How did that happen? When you put your heart and soul into something, they notice it. Also, the reverse is true. Relationships, same. When you really want to be with someone because you love the person 100%, that's something impossible not to feel. And then you can get through with your spouse, with your significant other, with your partner, through any kind of problems. Mm -hmm. But when your heart is not in the relationship, I don't have time. We can't go through this. It's too difficult. You know, it's the same thing. So where is your next step? Slash, what do you believe in? Slash, what is your true job? All point to the same. Find that. Okay, I will, thank you. You're welcome. Intuition and true function, are they the same or different? What color is this stick? Only that? Brown. Okay. What is the stick's true function? Correct. When you answered, was that cognitive or intuitive? Correct. You answered yourself. So correct perception and correct function, ultimately, they have the same root. But truth is truth, function is function. The distinction between that is totally intuitive. Like. We have this subject just like this in Zen. When somebody is happy, I am happy. You become one with the person's mind. Subject just like this. Of course, object just like this. When somebody is hungry, you give that person food. You don't go hungry with them. Okay? You give that person food. We call that object just like this. The choice is intuitive, without thinking. Just a simple moment of reflection. When you think about it, 
you ruin the intuitive process. When you have the courage to refrain from thinking and just perceive this moment, then it gives spontaneous rise to intuition. Intuition is the function of your true nature. Remember that. It uses thoughts, but not thinking patterns. It uses emotions, but not emotional karma. So when you let your true nature function spontaneously, that's intuitive. It does not equal, but includes intelligence intellectually, intelligence emotionally. In fact, there's not much else to say about it. About what you just said, so you have your intuition, and this comes up from your true nature. Figuratively speaking, yes. And then this karma, where does this come from in where, your... From your own habits. This karma comes from... But where does these habits come from? Yeah. Habits and karma, in this case, the same. Are you interested in your own personal habits or the habit of the intuitive process? Because both are habits. That's why we train ourselves. You train more in the Dharma. Your intuition becomes habitual, not accidental. Not just a lucky find somewhere in the kind of trash pile of your own unfinished problems. It becomes a habit. But if you're interested in your karmic habits, well, we have our storehouse consciousness, our distinguishing consciousness, our creative consciousness. If you read the Compass of Zen, it's the eighth level, memory, seventh, distinguishing, duality making, and sixth, linking name and form, and working with a lot of ideas. That's the sixth. The first five is the physical senses. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and touch. That's where we store our habits. That's how we distinguish what kind of habits we want to use. And that's how we create or unmake habits with the sixth. And none of them is our true nature. None of them is truly us. It's just the software, not the operator. It's kind of easy to distinguish ourselves from the body. It's not obvious, but we can do that real quick. But to distinguish you from your own software, from your own karma inside, that takes practice. Not identifying with your thoughts, your feelings, your perceptions, but that takes practice. And that's why the habit of practicing is so important. Attached to your own karma, intuition doesn't work. It cannot come to the surface. The signal remains too faint. Your noise remains too strong. So I hope every one of us develops the correct habit of staying at this moment, the correct habit of practicing every time you can. And from time to time, we come together and share the Dharma again, attain the correct mind, follow the correct path, and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much for your attention.